Welcome to Model Engineering for Beginners, Part 28, Workshop Equipment and Taps and Dies. I was initially prompted to make this video by quite a lot of comments from viewers asking me very simple questions. And in this one video I will attempt to answer all of the questions in one go. A very common question that I get asked is really two questions. Do I need a lathe to make steam engines? And do I need a big lathe? The answer to the first question is yes, you really do need a lathe. And the answer to the second question really depends on the size of steam engine that you want to make. This is a medium sized lathe, it's my old Boxford. This is a shot showing the machine tools that I personally have in the workshop. Over in the right hand corner is my Boxford that you've just seen. And next to that is a milling machine, which is also a drilling machine if I want it to be. It isn't essential to have a milling machine, but it does make life easier. A cheaper alternative is to use a top slide milling attachment for your lathe. To the left of the milling machine is my pillar drill. You can, however, buy a much cheaper and much smaller bench type drill press, one that sits on a bench. When making model steam engines, you do actually have to drill quite a lot of holes. This next part of the workshop is very important. It's a workbench. Recently, I've put a piece of white melamine board on my workbench. You don't need this, you just need a solid surface to work on. The piece of melamine is for video purposes only. The idea of it is that it reflects the light from the overhead lamp back up to whatever I'm videoing, and I get a clearer image. And while on the subject of lighting, it is very important in any workshop to make sure that it is very well lit. LED lighting is currently my preferred method for a couple of reasons. Well, the obvious one is they don't use much electricity and they don't flicker as much as the energy saver type. Any fluorescent tubes can be a problem near rotating machinery. Depending on the mains frequency and the speed of rotation of your lathe chuck, for instance, can in rare cases make it so that the chuck, even though it's revolving, appears stationary. In the opposite end of my workshop is the hand tool section. My advice is to buy the largest vice you can afford or fit in the workshop. This is a really big one. It's so big, in fact, I sometimes use it as a press. Most of my hand tools are in a really useful rack that was sent to me by a friend of mine called Norman. Above the hand tool rack are two small sets of drawers, absolutely full of nuts and bolts and things. And on the wall to the right are many more of these. In a workshop, it's important to know where things are, because it's quite surprising how much time you can waste just looking for bits and pieces in the workshop. I've been doing a lot of that lately because since I moved into the new workshop, some things are in the wrong place. Back over to the machine tool wall. Next to the drilling machine is a bandsaw. This is not essential, it's just very useful. And more importantly, it speeds up the job. Cutting a piece of two and a half inch diameter steel bar with a hacksaw is not what I call fun. This is not a very high quality machine, but it's been fine for the last 35 years. I also have this very old Burgess bandsaw. It's an excellent tool. It's especially useful because the blade is only a quarter of an inch wide, so it's good for going around very tight corners. Don't forget, it's very important in the home workshop to have storage areas for many things. For instance, boxes full of your metal stock and a suitable place which is quite cool to keep solvents and oils out of the way so you don't fall over them. For me, an essential workshop tool is a small compressor. This one's a quiet one, but you can get small ones that are noisy, but I prefer the quiet type. In my first workshop that I ever set up around 1980, I converted a fridge compressor to pump air into a tank. And really, that's all this one is, but the one I built cost me nothing. This one was quite expensive. I'm now looking at what I term the outer part of the workshop, this is where I do the silver soldering and the grinding and polishing. And it's right next to a door that I can leave open to make sure it's well ventilated. The brazing hearth that I use is nothing more than a substantial steel frame table with a wooden top covered in vermiculite blocks. It's a very simple thing and it works really well. Very much like an old girlfriend I used to have many years ago. Behind the brazing hearth on the bench is a small bench grinder and a pair of belt sanders, a 1 inch and a 4 inch. Right next to the brazing hearth, and as near to the door as possible, I have a polishing spindle. 
Please note that this is fitted with a guard and it's essential for a polishing spindle running at 3000 RPM. On the floor underneath the polishing spindle and once again right near the door is my sievert blowtorch and a large propane gas tank. Also in the outer part of the workshop is where I keep the larger pieces of metal. There are plenty of shelves in the outer part of the workshop and this is where I keep all my paint. I've had a bit of a tidy up recently because something very large, all being well, is going to be arriving in the workshop soon. More about this in a later episode. Back to the workbench now and I get one recurring question from many viewers asking me all about ME and BA taps and dies. And here is a selection of them. I'm going to attempt to explain why certain taps and dies are used for certain jobs. I'm going to start with having a look at ME taps and dies. ME stands for Model Engineering, because these threads are often used in model engineering. This is a 5 16 by 40 ME tap, and it even has a tapping size drill number written on it. 5 16 by 40 is not a commonly used ME thread. Here are three quarter by 32 taps, a taper, a second, and a bottom one, or a plug. These are very common and are used for steam fittings and also for steam pipe union nuts. The most common ones I use though are quarter by 40 threads per inch. Again there are three of them, a taper, a second and not quite a plug. Quarter by 40 threads per inch is commonly used once again for steam fittings and steam unions especially in miniature locomotives. This is a 3 8 by 32 ME tap often used on larger steam models for boiler fittings and union nuts to hold quarter inch diameter steam or water piping in place. They're also sometimes used for safety valves in boilers too. More commonly though, safety valves in model steam boilers are 26 threads per inch and here is a taper and a plug version of two 5 16 by 26 threads per inch taps. This is also a very commonly used thread form. 3 16 by 40 threads per inch. Often used for steam fittings on very small boilers and water gauge blow down valve pipe nuts as well as some cylinder drain cocks. Notice the same principle, you have a taper to start off with, an intermediate one called a second and then a plug tap to get to the bottom of a blind hole. These are 5 30 second by 40 taps, often used for small drain cocks and small oil cups. This is less common, occasionally you will find a 732nd by 40 tap. This size is sometimes used on pipe unions. This one's a 932nd by 40 tap, and I don't think I've ever used one of these, but it's still a member of the same ME family. This is quite common for certain applications, like small oil cup fittings, this is 1 8 by 40 threads per inch. In your collection you will also need a corresponding die for the taps that you already have. Here are a general assortment just sat on the bench, I've just emptied them out of a box. Now it's time to talk about BA taps and dies. This is a 7BA tap and the most popular BA British Association taps and dies are 0, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 10. 0BA is almost 6mm but not quite. The higher the number, the smaller the diameter of the tap. You can get smaller BA sizes than 10BA, but they're really tiny. 10BA is about the smallest tap that I can handle without breaking it. And even then it can be touch and go. It all depends on the type of metal that you're threading. If it's brass, it's probably going to be okay. If it's hard steel, rather you than me. Quite a few of these taps and dies that I'm showing you are carbon steel. They are cheaper than high speed steel, and they basically do the job, but they're not as good. High speed steel taps and dies are better. The big question is, why do we use ME and BA type thread sizes? That's because most of the old and even current steam engine designs go back to the time period when BA, British Association, and ME, model engineering threads, were the norm. You could use metric, but then it all gets very confusing because anyone comes along and tries to work on what you've made your metric threads will not correspond to the thread form shown on the drawings. If you are one of my Patreon supporters, on the $5 a month tier, 
you can get a free download of my ebook, which is called The Complete Guide to Miniature Steam, and contained within this ebook is a wealth of information. I really recommend that you download it. It runs on your computer like a website, and there are printable options, so you can just print off all the text if you want. I covered ME and BA thread forms in the ebook. Here is a text extract from it. And that's about it for this episode. I do hope that I've answered some frequently asked questions. I'd just like to say, stay safe, stay well, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.